Hey, can we say thank you to Annie and all of our worship team? And we're not done yet. We have some more uh, songs at the end of the service as well. But I want to wish you a Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas in our brand new church home. This is our first time celebrating Christmas here at 1300 North Kellogg. And we celebrate. I want to start this service with just a mass survey. How many of you are planners? If you're a planner, would you raise your hand really high? All the planners in the house, you know who you are. You have all of your gifts bought, wrapped, under the tree, ready to go at Halloween time. Ready? <laughs> How many of you are more spontaneous? If you're more spontaneous, would you raise your hand? How many of you are starting your Christmas shopping right after the service is over? <laughs> you are so dead. And we all have these different traditions along the way as well. Some of your families may be the kind of families that everybody gets their gifts and you unwrap them all at one time. How many of your families do that? Raise your hand, do it all at one time. Uh, it takes about five seconds. <laughs> There's three injuries and wrapping paper everywhere. But some of you may be a little bit more like my family, where you open them up one gift at a time. How many of that is you, hands up all over? And if you have a really big family, you finish on December the 28th. <laughs> Get everything all finally done then. You know, I am excited about Christmas time and uh, we celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ. And I can't help but think about the, the birth of, of Jesus, but I was just reflecting upon uh, my, the birth of my own children as well. And I remember when my son Braden was born, uh, we brought him home from the hospital, and, and then my daughter Sadie was two years old at the time. And uh, Shannon had this great idea. She said, hey, whenever we come and introduce Braden to Sadie, why don't we bring her a little baby doll as well? And so I was like, that's awesome. So, so we got home from the hospital. We said, here's your baby brother, Brayden. And she was so excited. She gave him a big hug and a big smile. And then we said, and we have a baby doll for you as well. And she lit up like a Christmas tree. And we said, what are you going to name your little baby? And, and this fast, she said, Moses. <laughs> that's when you know that you're a pastor's kid. And she shortened it from baby Moses to, to baby Mo. And everywhere that Braden wasn't, there would be baby Mo. So in the, in the high chair, after Braden would get up, then baby Mo would go into the high chair. After Braden would finish sleeping, then she would take baby Mo and she would tuck him in into Braden's crib for a nap. And then one night, Shannon and I were watching TV, and, and Shannon's nursing Brayden. And so she comes up onto the couch, and she pulls up her shirt. <laughs> and she latches little baby Mo on to her two-year-old little body. <laughs> All of us love a good birthing story. I don't know how well my wife's going to like me telling that story today. But today I want to tell you the greatest birth story in the history of the planet. Amen. And I bet you can guess what it is. That's right. Here at Crosspoint, we say if you don't know the answer, just, just cry out, Jesus, right? <laughs> the greatest birth story that ever happened on this planet is the story of Jesus. It is the, the birth of Jesus. But today I want to take it through the eyes of Joseph. And I believe that Joseph, man, he deserves some honor. Can we just give Joseph some honor today, okay? Give Joseph a little honor today. <clears throat> because I believe that Joseph is very underrated in the Christmas story. I mean, you don't hear very many songs. Eddie had to like dig deep to find a song, okay, about Joseph. There's lots of songs about Jesus, lots of songs about Mary. You know, there aren't very many poems written about Jesus. You're not going to, you know, find a lot, a Christmas card about Joseph, okay. It's like there, there's not a whole lot whenever it comes to, to Joseph. As a matter of fact, Joseph isn't even the most famous Joseph in the Bible. The most famous Joseph is found in the, in the book of, of Genesis. Joseph, he wasn't 
Jesus' actual father, he was his stepfather. And maybe some of you are stepfathers here today. Joseph could be a, a, a role model. Those of us that have adopted children, Joseph could be, you know, kind of our role model. But he's also a role model for, for all Christian fathers as well. I think it takes a lot of humility to be Joseph. I mean, he, he lived with his wife Mary, who was full of grace. And Jesus, who was sinless. That means Joseph would have had to take full responsibility for everything that went wrong in the marriage. Couldn't be Mary's fault. And everything that went wrong in the home because, you know, it wasn't Jesus' fault. And he played this unique role in the greatest story of all time. And Joseph's story, it starts with an interruption. An interruption to his plans. Because Joseph, he had a plan. He had it all figured out. He's like, this is the way it's going to go down. But then there was an interruption. Let me ask you, have you ever faced an interruption in your life? In 2017, did you have any interruptions? Maybe some of you right now are facing a little interruption in your family right now around Christmas time because of some family drama that's going on in your family. Maybe there's an interruption because you're facing a health crisis and, and you've you're got this medical battle that's going on. You know, for so many times, we, we hear people say that Christmas is, is the best time of the year. But for many people, Christmas time can be the worst time of the year. See, Christmas is a great magnifier. When things are going good, man, it is magnified at Christmas time. Your family is there. Man, you're opening up gifts. There's smiles on people's face. Great food you're enjoying. It's a great magnifier. But when you go through interruptions and when you go through pain and when you go through loss, Christmas can also be a great magnifier as well. I talk about the empty chair. Some of you this Christmas... You will have an empty chair around your Christmas table for your Christmas dinner. Some of you this year will have an empty chair around the Christmas tree. Because someone that you love dearly has passed away. Used to be there, but they're no longer there. I was reading Psychology Today, and they came out with this stat that said for 40% of people in America, they dread the holidays for one reason or another. Being aware of this, this past week, I, I, I just posted on Facebook, if you've lost a loved one, man, just, just post who you lost and I would be happy just to, just to pray for you during this Christmas season. And I found myself over the last three or four days just scrolling through my Facebook feed one after another, after another, after another. So many of you posted, my friends, my, my, my family members. And I want to let you know that Scripture says, God blesses those who mourn for those that mourn shall be comforted. And if you are at this Christmas time with an empty chair around the table, I'm praying for you. And most importantly, may you recognize that, that God is with you as well. Joseph's story, it starts off with some inconceivable news. Matthew chapter 1 and verse 18, it says, this is how Jesus the Messiah was born. His mother Mary was engaged to be married to Joseph. But before the marriage took place, while she was still a virgin, she became pregnant through the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, I just picture this scene. Imagine Mary trying to explain this to Joseph. It's a very difficult, it's not what you're thinking, Joseph. Joseph's like, where is he at? I'll kill him. She's trying to explain this. And when I read this passage of scripture, I can't help but think about uh, the scene in the movie Father of the Bride 2. Where Steve Martin his name is George in the movie, he finds out that his wife is having some health complications. So they go to the doctor to figure out what's wrong with her. Watch this clip. Nina, George. Well, we ran a panel on you with blood. Nina, whatever it is, I just want you to go in here. 
and you can count on me. Okay. We're going to get through this together. Okay. okay. So uh, tell us, uh, what is it we can handle it? What's wrong with her? Nothing. <laughs> Nothing that won't go away in nine months. Kids, you're going to have a baby. Nina's pregnant. Oh, my God. Pregnant? <laughs> and who, may I ask, is the father? <laughs> George. Don't George me, you two-timing Matahari. <laughs> How could this happen, Nina Dickerson? Why are you calling me by my main name, you big jerk? <laughs> That's how I picture Joseph. And may I ask who the father is? See, Joseph, he didn't plan this, and his plan was devastated in a moment. Matthew chapter 1 and verse 20, it says, As he considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Joseph, son of David, the angel said, Do not be, what's the next word, church? Afraid. Do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child within her was conceived by the Holy Spirit. See, before God can change your life, he first has to change your mind. Joseph had a plan and he had to have a mind shift. There was something that Joseph had to accept. And I just wonder, is there something today that God wants you to accept today? Maybe it's a limitation. Maybe it's a challenge. Maybe it's an empty chair. Something that God wants you to accept today. But it's difficult to accept something that you don't get to affect. It's difficult to accept something that you didn't get to vote on. It's difficult to accept something when God doesn't like consult you first to ask you what you think about it before it comes into your life. And here's Joseph at this time where there's this major interruption. And he's like, I'm, I'm afraid, and here he is, and Scripture says that, that he's afraid, and I was wondering, well, why is Joseph afraid? Well, obviously he's afraid because there's this angel in front of him. I mean, if all of a sudden you went to this dream and there's this major angel in front of you, you might be afraid as well. But let me ask you today, what has you afraid today? What has you afraid you know, maybe for Joseph, he was afraid of losing the woman that he fell in love with. And maybe for some of you, you're afraid of losing a relationship this Christmas. Maybe for some of you, you are afraid of being lonely. Maybe for some of you, you are afraid of being single and it has you afraid. Maybe Joseph was afraid that he was going to lose his reputation I mean, he could just hear his friends and his family talking about what Mary did behind Joseph's back. And, and he could hear all the rumor mill kind of flying along the way. And maybe for some of you, you're afraid of losing your reputation. Maybe your integrity, maybe your character is up for debate. Maybe Joseph was afraid because he felt like he wasn't enough. I mean, he had given Mary everything, relationally, physically, emotionally, spiritually. And he's thinking to himself, I gave her everything that I have. There's nothing more I could give her. And yet she still had needs that were unfulfilled. She still had to go somewhere else to find fulfillment other than me because I'm not enough. Maybe some of you can relate with Joseph. And you feel like you're not enough. You're not enough for your father. You're not enough for your mother. You're not enough for your husband. You're not enough for your wife. You're not enough for your children. And there was this interruption that came into Joseph's life. Maybe Joseph was afraid because his vision was shattered. He had this dream. He's like, we're going to get married. We're going to have two kids. It's going to be a boy. Then it's going to be a girl. We're going to laugh together. We're going to cry together. We're going to play together. We're going to pray together. We're going to live happily ever after. And then in a moment, 
his vision, his dream, it's crushed, it's gone. Maybe some of you are afraid because your vision in 2017 was shattered. You lost your dream in a moment. Would he ever be able to love anyone like he loved Mary? Would he ever be attracted to anyone like he was attracted to Mary? Maybe Joseph was afraid because he was starting to doubt God. Now, we know scripture says that Joseph was a righteous man. That means that he he did what was right. He was going God's way instead of the world's way. But I can't help but Joseph, we know he was righteous because Joseph said to Mary, he was thinking in his mind, he was rehearsing. He's like, I'm not going to put her away publicly. Listen, I'm not going to put her in front of the crowd. Listen, she's not going to be the town whore. Listen, well, I'm going to protect her reputation. I'm going to make sure that, guess what, everything's going to be okay with her and her reputation. Along the way, but it's not going to work between us. But then in his, as he's thinking, he's like, but God, why? Why did this have to happen to me? I'm a righteous man. I'm a good man. Man, I'm doing what you want me to do. I'm a generous soul. I'm caring. I'm loving. Maybe for some of you today, you begin to doubt God. And you begin to wonder, God, why is this happening? I go to church. I pray. I read my Bible. I I give money. I, I, I tithe. God, I don't understand why. And it has you afraid. Matthew chapter 1 and verse 20, it says in verse 20, he considered, or verse 21, go ahead and go to 21. It says, and she will have a son is what the angel said. Don't be afraid because Mary's going to have a son and you're to name him Jesus. For he will save his people from their sins. You know, we hear a lot of people say today, Jesus is the reason for the season. Maybe some of you have been saying, Jesus is the reason for the season. And we want to make sure that everyone knows it's not happy holidays, it's Merry Christmas. Oh, and by the way, Jesus is the reason for the season. But can I tell you today, Jesus is not the reason for the season. Sin is the reason for the season. He came so that he could save his people from their sins. And Jesus came, sent by God on a rescue mission to rescue those of us that are lost in our sin, our self, and our stuff so that we could be reconciled to a holy God. And verse 22 says, all of this occurred to fulfill the Lord's message through his prophet. Listen to me, church. Every interruption that happens in your life, interruptions can be an invitation to experience the presence of Jesus in your life. These interruptions that you're like, why? I don't understand. They can be a divine invitation so that you can be able to experience the presence of Jesus in a powerful way in your life. And whenever you understand the purpose, there can be purpose beyond your pain. And Matthew chapter 1 and verse 23, the, the angel says to Joseph in verse 23, we are having some technical difficulties today. Here's verse 23. 23 says this. It says that his name shall be called Emmanuel. And Emmanuel means God with us. And I'm glad that God is above us. But church, I'm also glad that God is with us. Aren't you, church? That God is with us. And when we understand that God is with us, we can then understand that every interruption in our life can be a divine invitation to experience God with us. And when God is with you, guess what? It changes everything. Because when you feel like you're not enough, you can go back to Romans chapter 8 and verse 31 that says, if God is for us, then who can be against us? See, that's what happens when God is with us. We can be able to go to Romans chapter 8 and verse 37 when we realize Emmanuel, God is with us. We can be able to say we are more than conquerors through Christ Jesus that's in us. And whenever we recognize this 
interruption being this divine invitation to Emmanuel, God being with us. That's whenever we can be able to say, greater is he that's in us than he that is in the world. And church, when your vision is completely shattered and your plan gets completely messed up, but you recognize that God is with us, you can be able to go to Isaiah chapter 43 and verse 19, and you can be able to read that God is doing a new thing in your life. I'm about to do something new, he says. See, I've already begun. Do you not see it? I'm going to make a pathway through the wilderness. I will create rivers in the dry wasteland. But you only get to this new place and this new vision and this new dream when you are understanding that this interruption is a divine invitation to be able to experience the presence of Jesus. And the birth of Jesus was a new vision. It was a new dream. It was a new hope. And you have to learn to be able to trust in faith like Joseph. Even when you don't understand the plan. Mark chapter 1 and verse 24, or Matthew chapter 1 and verse 24, it says this. It says that when Joseph, when he woke up, when he woke up, maybe some of you today, you need to wake up today. When when he woke up, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded, and he took Mary as his wife. See, sometimes you have to obey even when you don't truly understand. And maybe God's calling some of you to pick something up today. Maybe to offer an apology. To forgive. To obey even when you don't understand. And and you don't have to understand fully to obey faithfully. Recognize that this interruption can be an invitation to the presence of Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us. Leave you with a story today of this wealthy man and his son. And they had this great love for each other as a father and a son. And this wealthy man had purchased all of these expensive paintings and they had hung them up all over their beautiful estate. And they had everything from Picasso to Rembrandt. And the father and the son, they would sit together and they would admire all of these beautiful paintings. But then the war broke out. And the son enlisted into the military. And he was a courageous soldier. And through his courage, he gave up his life for another soldier. When word got back to the father, the father mourned and he grieved the loss of his only son. But then about a month later, right around Christmas time, there was a knock on the door. And at the door was this soldier dressed to the nines in his military outfit, his uniform. And the father opened the door to see this soldier with this large gift on his arm. And the soldier looked at the father and said, you don't know me, but I want to let you know that I'm the soldier that your son gave his life for. And I'm extremely grateful. And I want to tell you how much he talked about you. And how much he loved you and how much he talked about these beautiful paintings that you guys had. And how you guys would sit together and talk and admire these paintings. And the soldier said, I'm not much of an artist, but I just want to give you this. And the father opened the package to find that the soldier had painted a picture of his son. And when he looked at the picture of his son, he was in awe. And he would look into the eyes of his son. And as he looked into the eyes of his son, tears began to flow down his face. He loved that painting. He put it on the mantle and he would just look at that. And he would just brought him closer to his son. The father, he passed away. And whenever he passed away, Word got out that there was going to be an auction with all of these expensive pieces of art. From Picasso to Van Gogh to Rembrandt. And so people traveled from miles away to be able to come to this auction. And when they got to the auction there that day, the very first painting that was up was the picture of the sun. 
and the place was crowded, much like this place right here. And the auctioneer got up and he said, and for the very first piece, it's the portrait of the son. And he pounded the gavel and he said, who will bid on the son? And there was silence. No one said a word. And he said, who will give a price for the son? And there was a voice that came out of the crowd that said, we don't want the son. Skip, skip the son. Get on with the bidding. We want to see the masters. They began to get angry and they said, come on, get on with the real bids. But the auctioneer said, the son. Who will take the son? Who will take the son? And finally a voice in the very back said, I'll bid $10 for the son. And the voice was from the gardener of the wealthy man and his son. And he didn't have much money. He was very poor. But he said, I'll give $10. And the auctioneer said, will anyone give 20 And there was silence. And he said, going once, going twice, sold for $10. And then he laid down the gavel. And he said, I'm sorry, the auction is over. And the people got restless and they said, well, what about the other paintings? That's why we came. And the auctioneer said, when I was called to conduct this auction, there was a secret stipulation that was found in the will that I wasn't allowed to reveal until now. Only the painting of the sun will be auction auctioned. And whoever takes the sun gets everything else. <laughs> whoever gets the sun gets the estate and gets all the other paintings. And I'm here to tell you today, church, that God sent his son Jesus to this incredible playground that we call earth. And whoever takes the son gets everything. Whoever says Emmanuel, God is with us. They get to experience significance. Whoever takes Emmanuel, the son, that's when you truly find true love. When you get Emmanuel, God with us, that's when you truly get certainty in your life. That's when you get to contribute. That's when you get to experience life to the fullest. I want to ask you to bow your head and close your eyes today. Maybe you're here today and you're searching for everything else that this world has to offer. May I ask you this penetrating question today? Who will take the sun? In the midst of the interruptions of life, Maybe your interruptions have brought you to this moment because your interruption is a divine invitation to embrace Emmanuel, God with us. If that's you here today, the Bible says that we confess with our mouth and we believe in our heart. That's how we are reconciled. Jesus is the reason for the season, but let me tell you, it's only because of our sin that's the reason for the season. If today you'd like to take the sun today, here's what that means. It means that you pray this prayer. You might just pray it after me. You just pray it right now. Just say, dear God, maybe it's been a long time since you've called out his name. Just say, dear God, I'm asking you to forgive me of my sins and take full control of my life. I am declaring Emmanuel, God with me. I need your presence, God. I need you in my life, and I give you everything that I am today. In Jesus' name I pray. All God's people said, amen.